I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. I'm Gil Jenkins. And this is Climate Positive. If we can provide technology to make those cold chains more reliable and ultimately easier to deploy, we're just an enabling tool, but it helps get those compounds to the people that need it most. So I think there's a huge international opportunity to expand cold chain and technologies and make it more effective as well. We all depend on the cold chain to keep our foods, vaccines, and medical equipment safely chilled from production until use. But this energy-intensive process requires constant monitoring. As the CEO of Therma, Monique Suri deploys small mobile sensors that monitor conditions to optimize efficiency and quality. His work is infused with his family's legacy of service to others, and his team is dedicated to leveraging technology to improve the well-being of both people and planet. Monique, thanks so much for joining us on Climate Positive today. It's a pleasure, Hillary. Thanks for having me. So before we get into Therma, I want to touch on your background and this thread of interest in technology as a climate solution. You've worked on government issues in a number of different roles, but you seem to be drawn to technology. Why is that? Yeah, it's a great observation. I never thought of it that way, Hillary. Maybe it's proximity. I grew up in the Central Valley of California in an ag town called Fresno, which is about an hour from Silicon Valley. So maybe it was just uh, the appeal uh, or the idea of tech growing up. I think Stanford was, you know, an hour and a half from where I lived and, you know, used to visit and, you know, got very excited because my friends in college and some of my colleagues got involved with technology early on in some of the internet 2.0 and social media companies that scaled. And I got to see the impact that tech can have at scale. And, you know, at the time, I wasn't thinking I'd pursue it as a career. I really thought I was going to move into law, government, kind of more traditional ways of trying to make an impact. And I went to law school, worked in government, and got inspired. I was listening to a woman in D.C. giving a talk. She was the deputy CTO in the first Obama administration, and she had gone to law school and had gone to Harvard undergrad 10 years before me. And her book, the first book that she was giving a talk on was called WikiGov about how tech was transforming life, social and commercial, but big public problems weren't being tackled, like governance and sustainability and safety. And so that idea that you know you could take technology and deploy it or build it for social impact really appealed. That was a decade ago. And I decided to move into tech first as a in a nonprofit academic setting and then as an entrepreneur. And what is her name? Yeah, her name is Beth Novick. Oh, gosh. I've told the story a few times, but uh, she's an inspiration and a a mentor and and someone who I credit a lot of good things to. Beth, she teaches at NYU and elsewhere. That's fantastic. And so after working in the White House, you co-founded the Governance Lab at New York University. Again, leveraging technology to solve some of these pressing challenges of the world. What was your excitement about that space? Well, that that was exactly the moment in which I joined forces with Beth. So she convinced me to leave government and join her. She teaches at NYU at New York University. And so she had raised some capital from nonprofits and we were building out a center. And she basically articulated this vision that I aligned very much with, which is that technology can be deployed in service of many different objectives. And it's a powerful force for change. But instead of focusing on making pizza delivery faster or photo sharing easier? What if we could use it to help improve sustainability or governance or public health and safety? And I love pizza and I really enjoy sharing (laughs) photos. Uh, I have a two and a half year old. So I appreciate the power and the value of those kinds of consumer products. But as someone who I grew up in a culture of service, my parents are doctors, three of my grandparents are doctors, my wife, my brother are doctors. So I kind of had a lot of service in my family DNA And so the idea that, you know, one could use technology in service of solving these big problems seemed really appealing in 2011, 2012, particularly at that time, two things were going on. One, there wasn't a lot of legislation getting passed because the Democrats and Republicans couldn't agree on anything in the period that I, you know, worked in government, the debt ceiling. That was the first time that uh, there was a lack of alignment on the debt ceiling being raised, which is one of those typically non controversial moves. So it was kind of the beginning of the end 
of legislation by consensus. It was kind of the beginning of this super polarized period that's been going on. And that was really disappointing for me, at least as a young kind of idealistic wonk. I thought, oh, I'll go to DC. I'll help work on really important and interesting legislation and regulation, but nothing was getting passed. It was just political stalemate. And then in parallel, technology was achieving hyperscale in many areas. And you could just see, I joined Facebook the day it started. I think I'm like user 103. <laughs> and I saw platforms like Did you Facebook. get anything for that? I did not get anything for that. I did not join the company. So I, I, I had an opportunity to join in kind of the first 10 or so people, but I passed on that to go work in business as an investor. So I got to see some of these stories close and realized that tech could be and was changing everything even faster than historically had been true. The combination of mobile and the internet and cloud. And now as the CEO and co-founder of Therma, you've applied the technology to the cold chain. Can you tell us about the cold chain and how Therma addresses it? Yeah, absolutely. It comes full circle. You know, sometimes life makes sense in the rearview mirror. As my dad likes to say, it's kind of a, you're driving down the road, you don't really know where it's taking you, but it all makes sense when you look backward. I was visiting my folks in the Central Valley in Fresno a few years ago, and I was talking to some family friends about uh, problems they were dealing with in their work. And most of them, these folks I was talking to were in ag and food. And so they were describing how there's lots of inefficiency in the supply chain particularly because everything is analog. People aren't using digital tools. One of the big pain points that we were talking about and discovered was the way in which perishables are managed, kind of farm to fork. And you know, perishables, whether they're food or this is pre-COVID or pharmaceuticals, require refrigeration. Refrigeration you know, is essential for the delivery of two of the most important things, food and pharma you know, around the world. And I was just struck that everything was analog, you know, still using clipboards and paper and pen in a time when mobile had penetrated so much of the world and data was being used. And that's how I started thinking about refrigeration in the first place, that maybe we could use sensors and structured data to get a better and more effective signal out of these boxes. And I think as I was reading more about refrigeration, a friend who's a climate-oriented investor sent me an article about climate impact. It was a report by Project Drawdown which studies global warming and every year stack rank solutions. And they had ranked food waste as the number four solution out of 80 to global warming and climate change. And solution number one was refrigerant management. And I was just shocked by that, that refrigeration touches on two of the most significant solvable problems in climate change. And that was an aha moment for me because I didn't know anyone working on refrigeration. Like I couldn't find anybody working on it And that also seemed like an opportunity, the kind of, you know, unsexiness and the obviousness of it, the fact that it's everywhere, but we don't really think about it and it's causing warming. And there was an irony there too, you know, like the warmer the planet gets, the more we need cooling, but cooling is causing warming. It's kind of vicious feedback loop just felt very worthwhile to look at. And that's how Thermo was founded and born. I remember being shocked when I saw that list from Project Drawdown and as you say, you don't really think about refrigerants as a driver of climate change, but it's so impactful. Yeah, I think some of these like obvious and kind of ignored areas are just, they're waiting for us to think differently because for a hundred years, you know, I think the entire 20th century, we were able to build and deploy and use resources with a kind of mindset of plenty and abundance. And then in the 21st century, we're starting to shift into a mindset of scarcity because the planet's paying the bill for all of that overuse and overconsumption. And so some of these assets and some of these ideas like, hey, we can just cool things and it doesn't matter you know, whether they're connected or intelligent, we just let them run forever. Or if they break and fail, we just replace them. That mindset is shifting and that needs to. It's a good time for it. So tell us about the Therma solution. What does a Therma technology look like? Absolutely. So we do two things at Therma. We use sensors and controls to turn cooling up and down and to monitor it continuously. So we can control and optimize cooling assets, cooling being air conditioning and refrigeration. So we work on those two areas. We expanded into air conditioning last year, realizing that our approach applied to both refrigeration and cooling. And then the second thing we do, in addition to you know turning these things up and down, is we use intelligence to get better and better at knowing when and how long to turn things up and down and to predict or catch when they're going to fail. So 
you know, if, I, if you think of it as kind of a body, sometimes I describe it to friends, you know, using a, a human body metaphor. There's the arms and the feet and the limbs. Those are the hardware enabled parts of our business, IoT sensors and controls. And then there's the intelligence, which is the brain and the mind. That's the knowing when and how long to turn stuff off using a whole bunch of signals, energy price, utilization, uh, the type of business, the weather, zip code, et cetera. And we do that to save businesses money on their energy costs and to lower their spoilage or food costs while also catching equipment issues. So helping them with their equipment costs. And so clients will sign up for this technology that they can install themselves. They can install the sensors themselves. And then Therma provides long-term management and monitoring, correct? That's right. The sensor products entirely do it yourself. You can get up and running in 20 minutes. The joke is a 20-year-old can get it up and running without, you know, talking to a technician or a technology vendor. So it is self-installed. The optimization controls, we actually have technicians install. So if a customer decides to purchase our energy optimization product, we actually send out a technician to do the install in a couple hours. And if they install this sensor in their refrigerator, for instance, that's then replacing the clipboard with the piece of paper that would otherwise be on the front of the fridge, tracking the temperature and making sure there's no food spoilage whenever somebody thinks to check the temperature. Exactly. Exactly. It's replacing the clipboard. It's also giving you remote monitoring. So lots of times if these locations aren't staffed and, you know, can catch issues that happen during, uh, you know, nights and weekends in particular. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of outlier events that happen that we can catch that a clipboard wouldn't pick up. So, for example, if the utility cuts power because of a brownout, we can catch those that happened in Northern California a bunch during wildfire season over the last several years. And we were able to save tens of thousands of inventory for customers who didn't know brownouts were going to hit their locations. Or there could be human error. People unplug stuff to cool it and clean it and then forget to plug it back in. That happens a ton. There were a bunch of reports of COVID-19 vaccines being lost because of coolers and chillers being unplugged and not plugged back in. We catch those. And then we can also predict in some cases, when equipment might fail, looking at the data, which a clipboard couldn't do. What role do you think AI will play in the long-term monitoring of this equipment? Yeah, I think it's a very powerful moment for anybody building technology. It's powerful because AI, as a general set of technologies, could supercharge existing models and existing algorithmic approaches. So uh, what we're doing today with energy optimization and equipment prediction uses a set of techniques that are a part just econometric and just regressions and part applied machine learning. So we're building, essentially, we're building profiles of locations and using how that location operates and performs in real time to get better and better at knowing when and how long you can turn stuff off. And that's without AI, that's just using applied ML. And I think what we're seeing and hearing from friends and colleagues in other sectors is that the results from applying AI to other optimization functions, you know, those results are pretty impressive and are in many ways outperforming existing models. So it's, you know, I think there is the potential to go from, you know, high school to call, you know, the Ivy League here with the intelligence or, you know, from generation one to generation two in terms of getting more and more efficiency and getting more and more savings out of these boxes. We'll see how those technologies develop and how you can harness them. That's kind of a big frontier. And you've said that Therma sees refrigeration as untapped batteries with controllable loads. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a bit of a funny or kind of non-obvious concept. It was hard for me to get my head around the idea of a fridge as a battery in the beginning. But basically, if you imagine a physical space, air in a physical space, You bring cooling into that space. You're basically using energy to cool down the temperature. That's the basic principle of cooling. That's true of a fridge or an air conditioner. When you've cooled down that space, energy is stored inside the space in the form of cold effect or colder environment. And what's, I think, interesting is if you turn off the cooling, if you turn off the fridge or the air conditioner, the space starts to warm up. I think... Unfortunately, we all know that from this last summer and the last few summers, the warming curve, how quickly that space warms up is essentially the distribution of that energy. It's the release of that energy back into you know a warmer environment. And so if you kind of step out of this or step back from this and you think of that space 
as a thermal battery, you're loading the battery, you're charging the battery by cooling it, cooling the space, and you're discharging the battery or tapping it by letting it warm up. What's exciting is that we can actually tap batteries, we can actually warm up spaces for short periods of time without affecting guests or product. And that's the potential, that's the opportunity to warm things up either when no one's there or when there's low utilization or because there's a latent amount of buffer. So sometimes things are colder than they need to be and you can actually take advantage of that difference and let them warm up a little bit. All of those are examples of tapping the battery. And if you imagine that in scale, there are hundreds of millions of these pieces of equipment around the world that are kind of sitting there as untapped batteries. And so you're looking not just at the refrigeration of a freezer or a fridge, but also the HVAC units and the ambient temperatures. Exactly. We realized, uh, you know, a year and a half ago that air conditioning and refrigeration are a spectrum. You know, philosophically, they're the same concept of applying energy and using refrigerants to cool a physical space. It's just a spectrum, you know, and a cold storage warehouse is kind of an interesting, you know, is it just super air conditioned or is it refrigerated? You know, where does the line blur? And so the concept of tapping that space and using sensors the whole time to monitor the temperature, we realized that we could do that with an air conditioned space as well as a you know refrigerated space using our sensors and our intelligence. So that's how we added air conditioning into the platform. And what is the ongoing relationship with a client like? Yeah, we, we're trying very much to be as customer centric and as responsive as possible while taking advantage of technology. And so we've been fortunate and we kind of pride ourselves on being, uh, you know, very customer oriented. And so having historically you know, extremely low churn and high net churn, you know, meaning uh, customers generally expand with us and have expanded with us, you know, for years since we launched, we've been growing rapidly since early 2020 when we started commercializing, but we're a young company. So, you know, we're starting to look at ways to use technology, whether it's through SMS-based notifications or providing customer support through in-app messaging. Most of our customers work, you know, and provide services on nights and weekends. You know, we work with the food service and hospitality and retail sectors. So these are folks that are working at 11 p.m. on Saturday and 5 a.m. on Tuesday. They are not nine to five businesses, which means we have to be available in the background, you know, if things happen. But I think that what's exciting is through a combination of, you know, modern technology, we're able to deliver support, you know, and then we also have 24-7 staffing which allows us to be able to pick up the phone or answer a call. That's something we just added, kind of 24-7 staffing. And, you know, as we grow and scale, we hope to be able to maintain that kind of high-touch service. Hopefully people don't need it. The goal is for the product to be set and forget. So, you know, you only call us if there's a problem and make it as do-it-yourself as possible. So self-install, self-configuration, automation of the energy optimization. Climate Positive is produced by Hassi, a leading climate investment firm that actively partners with clients to deploy real assets to facilitate the energy transition. To learn more, please visit Hassi.com. So food waste is a huge space. Can you provide some estimates on how much food is wasted domestically? Boston Consulting Group had a very, you know, kind of rigorous study, which was cited quite a bit. It came out about five, six years ago now, but the data is still fairly fresh, no pun intended. I think they analyze all the sources of food waste and broke it down by problem area and segment of the supply chain. Roughly $1.6 trillion a year gets thrown out. Wow. Which is a third of all food that's made, which is a crazy number. I mean, a third. This is hard to imagine that a third of everything we grow, cultivate, produce, ends up getting, you know, put back in the ground. Now, of that $1.6 trillion, cold chain storage and handling. So issues around cold chain and storage and handling in particular, it was responsible for about 11% of that. So that's still, you know, over $150 billion a year, which is one of those numbers that is hard to quantify (laughs) because it's larger than the GDP of many countries. And that's just from like storage and handling of food. So, you know, there's many ways to slice and dice the food waste problem. We got inspired by the need or, or, you know, motivated by the size of the problem and say, okay, if you can make even a small dent 
in that small portion of the big problem, you know, that's a very large impact just because of the, the scale of the issue. And not only from the climate perspective, but also in a time of food insecurity across the world, it could have a tremendous impact. Yeah, there are like 800 million people that are living without adequate, you know, food every day, you know, almost a billion humans out of 9 billion. So it's like, you know, there's a humanitarian dimension to it. There's also, I think, just a, we have to kind of rethink how we approach resources more broadly. You know, we've got to learn to be a little more thoughtful and judicious about just not, you know, over consuming and over, overdoing things. Of course, the planet is a big part of that as well. But I think diet and wellness, there's other reasons. Can you tell us a little bit about what role you envision for Therma in the pharmaceutical cold chain? You've spoken and written passionately about vaccines and access to these life-saving drugs. And hearing that you've got lots of doctors in the family, it makes sense that you would have that fire in your belly for it. Well, definitely it's personal as well as professional. You know, I think just growing up around healthcare and then being around it now, my wife is a physician and academic. She teaches at UCSF and runs safety and quality for the health system. It's a good alignment of values. She spends a lot of time thinking about um, problems around supply chain and pharmaceutical accuracy and frankly, just, you know, many, many issues around safety and quality in healthcare. But the COVID-19 pandemic just shed a starker light on the importance of cold chain. I think in October of 2020, 60 Minutes and 2020 both had specials on Operation Warp Speed and the need for cold chain to get vaccines all over the country and all over the world. That was the first time that friends started calling me saying, oh, I heard you're working on cold chain. Like, wow, cold chain. Because it's really like not a problem that most people thought about. But because the new mRNA based vaccines were so temperature sensitive, it became very top of mind. Therma, you know, in some ways, right place, right time, we were able to provide a solution to some logistics leaders and also to now we've got, you know, a number of customers that have healthcare facilities. So we work with some pharmacies, some blood banks, some fertility clinics. We're exploring a deployment with a hospital group in the Southeast, providing better technology that can help reduce spoilage and, and prevent issues with the compounds. These are temperature sensitive products. I think it's just a way to help ensure that these things, these products get to people's families and to their bodies effectively. The last thing you want is to be injecting or, or consuming something that you're not sure what happened on the journey from production to your arm. But really, Hillary, my hope is that we can deploy internationally. I think the big need for expanding access to cold chain for pharmaceuticals is international. We've got reasonable supply chain and cold chain in the U.S., reasonable because there's still many gaps and it's not equitable in all places in the country. But you look at huge parts of the world, I think Associated Press, AP had an article in you know, late 20, early 21 that said about 3 billion people wouldn't be able to access a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine for like three years because it wasn't cold chain in their towns and villages. That's just crazy. You know, that's like a huge number. And I think that if we can provide technology to make those cold chains more reliable and ultimately easier to deploy, we're just an enabling tool, but it helps get those compounds to the people that need it most. So I think there's a huge international opportunity to expand cold chain and technologies that make it more effective as well. And you've thought a lot about this international angle. How do you anticipate deploying the thermo technology for the cold chain overseas? It's very personal as well. You know, I think that life often is kind of a blend of one's own lens and then what happens, you know, that's outside of our control. I grew up kind of between the U.S. and India. My parents had immigrated here in the early 80s, and then we moved back to India when I was seven. Interesting. What prompted that? You know, my parents were idealistic. They were young doctors. They'd gone to Columbia in Manhattan for post-medical school residency and specialization. And they both wanted to go back and try and make an impact in the country they'd grown up in. As I mentioned, three of my grandparents are, are doctors. My mom's mom is 93 and was like one of the first female doctors in the Indian army. My dad's oh my father was the president of the Indian Academy of Neurology. So my parents thought like, we'll move back. 
We'll make an impact. We'll take our kids. I have a brother who's three years younger than me. So we moved back for three years when I was seven to 10. And I think it was my mom who said, I can't do it. The culture and the mindset at that time, this is kind of late 80s, wasn't yet. It was difficult for her as an independent minded female physician, professional and working mom. She just found it was very hard to adjust back to the culture. So I think at one point she said to my dad, I'm going back to the States and I'm taking the boys. Like you can stay if you want. And that's where they decided to move to Fresno. Instead of going back to New York and settling down there, they said, okay, let's have a, we'll move to a smaller city, a smaller geography. But because I'd lived in India for three years and I go back every year, you know, I think I got interested in global affairs and the reasons why places are so different, even though people seem so similar. I got interested in that from a young age. So when I went to Harvard undergrad, I studied international relations. And then I got a fellowship to Cambridge at IR as my master's. And I was, I was interested in, in global policy and global affairs. That's why, you know, half my friends are in DC. So Therma, you know, is starting to deploy. We have customers in, you know, 10 countries. So we have shown the tech can work internationally. We're a small company, you know, we're like a little over 50 people. So we're not exactly a huge organization and we're based in the Bay Area in California. So it's hard to sell and scale internationally as a small team. But I think we've shown the tech can be deployed. And I was really proud of our ability to to sell and, and deploy internationally in the last few years. And I think the need is there. So it's a question of timing. We have a couple of international investors that have said, like, anytime you want to bring your technology to Japan, Korea, Middle East and North Africa, let us know. And And we've deployed in Europe, in the UK, and plenty of customers, I think, or interest elsewhere, if we can just grow to where we can support that. And so the Therma sensors are, they're mobile and they're relatively inexpensive to deploy, correct? They are. They're relatively inexpensive to deploy. For the customer, for our customers, the pricing is very straightforward. It's on our website. You can access and sign up and have them shipped to you within 20 minutes or even less, you know, probably 10 minutes. Just go on our e-commerce shopping cart and, and purchase and have them shipped to you. So it's, it's subscription-based pricing. And that makes it easier and simpler to deploy. There's no capital expenditure. You don't have to allocate huge budgets. There's no hardware costs. There's no implementation installation fees. Part of what we're trying to figure out is, does that pricing make sense in every part of the world? You know, obviously willingness to spend and budget is different in various parts of the world. But because we've been able to price so competitively, you know, our core product starts at it was $10 a month per sensor for the last three years. You know, we think that can scale internationally over time. Are you working with any of the domestic nonprofits like Gates or Chai? So the CEO of Chai is my best friend. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) My roommate from college, Buddy Shah, who lives in Berkeley. So we we meet up about once a week. He became the CEO last year of Chai. So we know the development community quite well, both socially and professionally. We've done some good early partnership with Feeding America and some Mm -hmm. of their food banks. We've been deploying technology to help reduce loss and to help improve safety. And I love that organization, just really good humans, really important mission. I think one in seven Americans is dealing with food insecurity and Feeding America is a big part of you know the solution. So we are working with a few other nonprofits. Refed works on food waste. It's a kind of consortium of mm-hmm. businesses and policy groups and you know love Dana and her team. And we're exploring ways to work with some of the multilateral groups like the UN and even smaller, you know, more niche players in food and food supply, but it's early. Yeah. Lots of room for growth. More problems than we could possibly solve in one lifetime, but at least it is a motivation to keep doing stuff. Great. So before we move on to a couple of final questions, anything you want to address that we haven't talked about yet? No, loving the conversation. I appreciate all the questions and, you know, I feel like you might know my life story better than most people except my mom. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for asking. Sure. All right. So let's switch to the hot seat questions. When I need to relax or recharge, I hike in the Presidio. Good option. Nice to be there. It's great. We're blessed. Other than Therma, a technology or a business that I'm excited about is I've been really inspired by the meat alternatives yeah. movement. I have a friend who works in a meat substitutes alternatives company. I think that the combination of saving 
animals and reducing emissions while delivering taste and quality. Hard for me to say because I am a meat eater and I'm my family's from North India, which they eat a lot of meat, but trying to become a more evolved person. So I'm starting to <laughs> lean that way. Anyway, if Buddy, if you're listening, Buddy is a vegan and has been trying to get me there for a long time. So yeah, love that <laughs> community of people and their tech. Great. I saw the CEO of Impossible Foods talk about how he took a sabbatical from Stanford and wanted to solve the biggest problem he could, and it was food waste and meat. That's great. I love that. Didn't know that. I want my family to be proud of me for? Dedicating my time to, that I'm not there with them, to something that, you know, is larger than myself. And then finally, to me, climate positive means? Doing good and doing well. Having your cake and eating it too. I really believe we can do both. I think we can deliver comfort and convenience and experience without over-consuming and, and doing dumb things and, and wasting resources. I think you can, we're creative enough and intelligent and resilient enough as a species to be able to do both. Great. Monique, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really fun talking with you and I'm so excited to see where Therma goes. Really a pleasure, Hillary. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please help us reach more listeners by leaving a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. You can also let us know what you thought via email at climatepositive at hasi.com. That's H-A-S-I dot com. I'm Hillary Langer, and this is Climate Positive.